So I'm sitting in a double wide mobile home with nine people who are at least twice as old as me and some of them three times older than me. And I'm in agony. To give you the context, I'm, I'm about 26 years old and I have this job, which is I work with mobile home park tenants who live in mobile home parks where they don't own their land. And when their parks come up for sale, I work with them to help them buy their parks and own them as cooperatives. So I'm in Bernardston, Massachusetts, sitting with the leaders of this 30-unit mobile home park. And the reason I'm in agony is because I am their consultant and they have asked me to interview confidentially everyone who lives in the park and find out if they have enough resources, if they have enough money in the group to be able to purchase the park. And so they're sitting there looking at me and I should tell you at age 26, I actually look considerably younger. I look like a high school student, I'm thin, I'm awkward, I have terrible skin. And they're kind of looking at me like, our future depends on this kid. <laughs> the and, uh, and so, but they've entrusted me and I've literally had confidential conversations with everyone there. I know what they have for savings. I know what their incomes are. I know what they could afford to pay toward the purchase of the park. And I'm in agony because I have to give them the report. I have to tell them the bad news that they don't really have the resources to buy this park. But the other reason I'm in agony is because I have a secret, which is I come from a wealthy family. In fact, at 26, but at the age of 25, I had inherited a substantial amount of money. Uh, all secret, no one there knew this. Uh, my great-grandfather was the meat packer, Oscar Meyer. And so my dad used to say, our family's secret is bringing home the bacon means something different in our family. <laughs> so I'm thinking, they have a, like a $35,000 gap. I could just write a check. I could pretend it came from somewhere else and these folks could, could keep their homes. They may not have to lose their park. So I'm actually thinking I might do that. Anyway, I explained to the leaders of this park, the nine leaders that are there, I said, you know, there's a group of people, mostly people in this room who are retirees and have a little bit of a nest egg to fall back on. But there's maybe a third of the group that has like no money and the, th the other third that almost are like, they have like, they're underwater. They're not really, they don't have any financial capacity. It's a fairly low income group. And you're about $35,000 short of where we need to be to have a down payment so that we could purchase this park. So the leaders all look a little bit sad for a moment. And then one of them, this guy Reggie, who's sort of jingling the change in his pocket, he says, I have enough to buy my share and I have another $6,200 I could put toward the purchase of the park. Now because I know everybody's private financial information that they don't know about each other, I happen to know that Reggie has just put every dollar he has on the table. And then the Dundorfs say, well, we have enough to buy our share and we have $5,300 that we can put in. And I happen to know that's all their money. And around the room, this group goes and it comes to Harlan and Mary Perro. We're sitting in their double wide mobile home. They said, we have enough to buy our share and we would like to help purchase Mrs. Rivas's share on the condition that she doesn't know that in order to protect her privacy and her dignity. And they go around the room and unbeknownst to each other, everybody in that room puts every dollar that they have on the table. And they have done it. They've closed the gap. They've raised the money among their group. And I have to say, it hadn't occurred to me that the people who had a little bit more could have put their more in. So they succeeded. They bought the park. At the day of the closing, all the 48 residents cram into this law office the men have cigars, they're making jokes. Harlan tells the Greenfield Recorder newspaper, we are like the Israelites who have been wandering in the desert. We just bought the land from Pharaoh. <laughs> we are hostage no more. And they were jubilant. 
And Mary came up to me and said, uh, you're a smart young man. Someday you'll go to college. And I'm like, I, I've been to college. I've actually been to graduate school, you know? She said, I don't know why you're hanging around. You, you could go work on Wall Street. You know, why are you hanging around with a bunch of old fogies like us? I said, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be today. And, uh, and she said, uh, oh, in a kind of a confidential maternal way, have you ever tried Noxema? <laughs> I'm like, uh. So that was an amazing day for me because something happened that day. I was struck, I had grown up in a wealthy community where people were generous, charitable, but I'd never seen people be all in in solidarity with each other. And in a really kind of spiritual way, I wanted what these people had. I wanted to live in a community where people were gonna be in all in for each other. And I began to reflect that the many that had kind of flowed to me was the barrier to my having really authentic relationships of reciprocity with people. I never had to ask people for anything. I could just pay for things. And that that was a barrier to my own journey. So I decided at the age of 26 that I would move this money along, that I would give it away. So I wrote my parents a letter thanking them for this opportunity and for not having to have debt going to college. And my dad called me up immediately after he got this letter. He said, uh, have you given away the money yet? I said, no. He says, well, I want to talk to you about this. And he actually came out from Michigan where I grew up, spent a day with me in Boston. He said, listen, you grew up in a bubble. You don't necessarily understand what the value of this money is. Bad things can happen. Like, for instance, you're single now, but what if you have a partner and that partner is ill? Wouldn't you wish you had that money? Or what if you have a child someday and that child has a special need? You're gonna wish you had that money. And I said, well, actually, I have thought about that. And if that were to happen, then I would be in the same boat as 99% of the people I know. I would have to get help. I, would, I have to build a community that you're, I really believe that you know, your security is in the community. I would have to lean on my friends, congregation, et cetera. My dad said, yeah, but in the end, you probably would have to fall back on government. And that's a lousy and tattered safety net. To which I replied, well, then maybe I would have a stake in fighting to make that a better safety net. To which my father wisely replied, oi. <laughs> so idealistic. He says, okay, I understand. I love you. No strings attached. You got to do what you got to do. So a couple months, weeks go by. I went to the National Bank of Detroit. I signed the papers over to a couple of foundations. Went back to my job working with mobile home park residents. I should say my dad, at the very end, he said, you know, all I really care about is that you be okay, that you're going to be okay. And I called him the day that I made that transfer. He said, are you going to be okay? I said, I think so. I, to be honest, I had no idea how much other advantage I had that was kind of hardwired into four generations of intergenerational wealth and security. So I went back to my job. A couple months go by, and then something bad happened, which is the house I was living in burned down. No one was hurt, but it's incredibly disorienting if you've ever had that happen. And I uh, had a sleepless night on a neighbor's couch, and the next day I'm standing out there with my housemate Greg, and we're just kind of looking at this wreckage of our house, looking for pictures or anything. A pole, four cars. Out of those cars come about 10 residents of the Bernardston Mobile Home Park. They have casseroles, shovels and trash bags. They've come to help us put our lives back together. And that was the moment I thought, I think I'm going to be okay. Thank you. Thank you.